Welcome to Practical 1, an introduction to Excel, part of the GA116 module, Introduction to Geographical Methods. In this session we're going to investigate some of the statistical methods and measures which we investigated in Lecture 2. We're going to do this using Excel. So at the beginning of each section is a link to a YouTube video. You've obviously found this first one. And these videos are meant to either accompany or be used on their own to go through this practical. This guide has been written specifically for Excel 2016. This is the version on all the university managed system. So if you attempt these on your computer at home, the location of tools may vary slightly, but basic instructions would and should remain the same. So the first thing to mention is that all data is stored on MOL for these sessions, and you can find these by clicking on my name weeks one to three Dr. Tom Perring and going to practical sessions and then you'll find all the data under practical one so I suggest that you do this now and save this to your personal university drive so you can access and save the data easily during the practical Please remember you can complete the practical at your own place, so don't worry if you don't finish and if you are familiar with Excel then feel free to skip through parts that you are familiar with. So today we're going to learn how to import data into Excel, how to perform basic mathem mathematical operations and manipulate numbers in Excel, perform individual statistical methods using your own formulae and use the data analysis function to perform descriptive statistics. Learning to use Excel well and as early as possible in your university career is one of the most valuable, valuable things you can do. It is one of the most commonly used software packages and you will undoubtedly use it multiple times throughout your work at university. But first, a reminder of some of the methods that we'll visit in this practical. Feel free to skip the latter part of this video if you're happy with the material that we covered in the lecture and get on with the practical. Okay, now I'm going to take you through some of the statistical methods that we're going to go through in these practicals. Again, if you are okay with these methods and you're happy with the lecture material, then probably best skip on to the practical. So there are three main measures of central tendency. We have the mode, the median, and the mean, or average. The mode is quite simply the most commonly occurring value, and is best used when we group data together in classes. We can just have one modal value, two modal values, three modal values, or even more than that. The graphs on the right demonstrate three different types of modes, so a unimodal, bimodal, and a trimodal, or multimodal. The median is quite simply the 50th percentile in the data set. It's the data point which is a 50th point, 50th percentile point in the data set. The median is much more popular and more appropriate where there is a non-normal skewed distribution which we'll go into much more detail in lecture 3. And we can calculate the median by adding the total number of data points in the in the data set, add 1 to it and divide it all by 2. And of course, if there are an even number of values, the median is the average of the central 2. The mean, which is possibly the most common form of measuring data set central tendency, but not always the most appropriate, is also commonly known as the average. And we denote the sample mean by the letter x with a bar across the top, and we call that x bar. The population mean is denoted by the Greek letter mu, and below we show the two different formulas based on whether we're looking for the sample mean or the population mean. However, there are several weaknesses of central tendency. Take this graph, for instance. Here we show two different modes, mode A and mode B, and we have the median, which is the 50th percentile of the data set, and the mean which are in broadly similar positions but not exactly the same position. So which of these is most appropriate in this instance? A further illustration. Here we have two sides of a valley and data sets with exactly the same mean, median and mode values. But side 2 has values of 67 and 84 
it shows much more variation which is not captured with the measures of central tendency. This is where we need methods for assessing the variability and dispersion of data sets and here we have a few available methods. We can look at the interquartile range, the standard deviation, the variance, the coefficient of variation and the z-score. The interquartile range is the difference between the upper quartile or the 75th percentile of a data set and the lower quartile, the 25th percentile of the data set. We refer to these as Q1 and Q3. So Q1 is the lower quartile, Q3 is the upper quartile. The median is referred to as the Q as Q2. So by subtracting subtracting Q3 from Q1, we get the interquartile range. First, we have to rank the data. We already know the formula for Q2, the median, and here are the formulas for Q1 and Q3. It should be easy for you to work out when we know that n represents the number of data points in our sample or population. The standard deviation is a measure of variability around the mean. And here we have the two different equations which are related to the sample and the population. The population on the left and the sample on the right. Note two important differences here that on the right hand side we subtract one from the total number of samples, so the total number of data points before dividing. And importantly, the standard deviation is expressed in exactly the same units as the data set. The variance of a data set is the standard deviation squared. Here we demonstrate two different normal distributions with exactly the same mean, but different standard deviations. So one with a much wider spread of data has a larger spread standard deviation, and one which is much more pointy has a smaller standard deviation. And one way of getting around this is using the coefficient of variation, which is a measure of the ratio between the standard deviation and mean, which is then converted to a percentage. So the coefficient of variation is the standard deviation divided by the mean. And here again we split the formula up based on whether it's a population or a sample. What's the point of the CV? The CV is particularly useful, as with the last graph, where data set standard deviation values are similar, but the mean values are not. Finally, we have the z-score. The z-score is a measure of how many standard deviations a value is from the mean. We illustrate with this normal distribution bell curve on the right hand side. So the z-score gives us a value between minus 3 and plus 3 approximately, which illustrates how many standard deviations and what proportion of data that's in. And that's uh, described by these equations here, again separated by the population and the sample. It is each individual data point subtracted by the mean divided by the standard deviation. So as with the standard deviation we can use z-scores to determine the percentage of values between set scores. For example 68.2 percent of the data in any normally distributed data set should lie between minus 1 and 1 and so on and so on. The z-score is good where we have similar data sets or one large data set. If we're comparing the variability of multiple data sets with different means, the coefficient of variation is still superior. I hope this has been helpful uh, and you can probably now continue with the practical.